from crease to crease and corner to corner. Better Hockey Now is NHL fantasy and betting done better. Step into the dot for Better Hockey Now on the Better Sports Network. That's right, folks. Welcome into another edition of Better Hockey Now here on the Better Sports Network and Fantasy Alarm YouTube pages. I'm your host, Adam Bernard, and my line mates, as always, are Mr. Anthony Rivera at AntRivera86 and Christopher Merez at FuzzyChris91. Gentlemen, good to have the band back together. How are we doing this week? It's a good week. It's a good week for some hockey, and uh, I'm excited about the topics we got going on this week, uh, especially as we inch closer to Christmas, New Year's, and the Stadium Series. That's right. Stadium Series is not that far away now. It snowed here for the first time. Those of you who don't know what that is, that is the white stuff that falls from the <laughs> sky and lands on the ground and then does not leave afterwards. So, Well, depending on where you are in New York City, like the sn- it'll snow and then it looks nice for like a day and then it turns gray and slushy. And then you have to like leap at the corners like you're like auditioning for the long jump in the Olympics. So, you know, I don't really deal with snow where I am now. Not gonna say I miss it. I miss I miss it when it's nice, and I miss and I don't miss shoveling it though. I got uh, shoveling to do a little bit later here. I'm gonna get my work boots out, get my shovel out, and uh, clear a path for me to exit my home at some point. Now, uh, like Anthony mentioned, we've got a few different teams we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, one of our teams is doing very well right now. One of our teams is doing yeah you know, about as expected, you know, give or take. And then one team, not so much. So we're going to talk about all three. Uh, we'll talk about two of the three. We're not going to really talk about the Canadians today. But uh, you said there's snow on the ground here. Let's uh, get to quick hits. And uh, that means we are at the NHL quarter season mark. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, some of what we are pleasantly surprised by and what we are disappointed by. Uh, so first up, I'm going to go with my pleasant surprise. And I, I'm sure you didn't have a rough time figuring out what mine was going to be. It's the New York Rangers. They are just world beaters right now they it doesn't matter who they play even like you know when a team like the sharks throw their best uh you know effort at them you know they've bounced back recently san jose and are playing like 500 hockey which is amazing uh that's besides the point but i thought there would be more of an adjustment period especially after the way things went with the rangers last year and you know kind of fell short of expectations but man like they're fun to watch it's you know, I'm all, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, you know, in seasons past, you know, this is anecdotal more than anything, but the Rangers tend to slump in December. So I'm kind of waiting for that, you know, to balance out the incredible start they've had where they have four regulation losses that were on December 4th right now. That's insane. I mean, I don't know if you want me to add something positive to this, Montreal. You said we're not going to talk about the Montreal Canadiens, so I'm obviously going to throw it in the first chance I got. I think Montreal has four regulation wins uh this season so yes the new york rangers are good they, they're probably two sport athletes as well specifically jacob truba who we saw we know he can swing a stick he can probably make contact with a 98 mile an hour fastball get that out of the park but yes it has been unfortunate to watch the rangers be so dominant from a fantasy perspective though like if you have guys like Artemi Panarin, I, I think a lot of people let him slip because he didn't shoot the puck and he wasn't scoring a ton of goals. Man seems to be eating whatever Connor McDavid was eating last year because uh, he is scoring goals in bunches. It is fun to watch them. Jonathan Quick seems to, you know, be fine. He seems he came down a little bit to earth there against San Jose because, of course, he did. But that is a really solid hockey team, and it's it's unfortunate, but it's good. Uh, they just have a lot of depth. I mean, they are are lined up pretty well right now, and you're getting good play, like you said, from Artemi Panarin, uh, who's scoring a lot of goals, and y- you're getting really good play from guys like Alexis Lafreniere and uh, even Jimmy VC on the fourth line. So uh, when you're getting play all the way down to your fourth line, and this team is is firing on all cylinders, you got we already talked. A, a whole lot of times about the goalie situation in New York uh, with the Rangers and their coach, uh, the, 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 the goalies coach and, and how he's able to turn, you know, the, the bench guy, uh, the, the backup into something that's viable. And, and we're seeing that with what's happened with Jonathan quick and this little Renaissance that he's having uh, towards the end of his career. 
Uh, the Rangers are looking really, really good right now, and uh, I know Adam is ecstatic about it. I am ecstatic about it, but I will say this. Right now, the Rangers, uh, they're playing very well. They're, they, they're, Panarin is playing some of the best hockey he's played since his Chicago days. Chris Kreider looks like the Kreider of two years ago right now. Trocek, Sabanajad down the middle, obviously, especially Mika, playing very well. Fox on the blue line. But they, they haven't faced any adversity yet. What's going to happen when Panarin starts to produce at a more of a normal level and the team regresses a little bit, and then the first time they do, you know, hit a bump in the road and lose, you know, three in a row or something like that. How are they going to respond to it? That's going to be the big test is, you know, does a two-game losing streak turn into a six-game losing streak, or do they snap out of it and get back to their winning ways? So when they start to encounter some adversity and seeing how they handle it, then I'll truly be excited. Now, honorable mention should go Arizona Coyotes, man. I mean, 12-9-2 and two right now. They're a plucky team. They're in every game. That you know, like, it's not crazy to say that they they could be a wild card contender. So, with the way the like we talked about last week, was you know, if we're assuming Edmonton's going to bounce back and get one spot, then who's going to get the other one? Arizona is very much in that mix. So, shout out to the Coyotes who are playing for every have every reason to not play well, and they are playing very good hockey. Yeah, they were a team that I was was starting to hone in on during the offseason when they made some of their moves. Obviously, they had Clayton Keller, uh, Logan Cooley, uh, uh, Nick Smoltz, and guys like that. They added Jason Zucker to the, to the group. Uh, Sean Dersey, who I really like uh, from the Kings, they added him as well. And, you know, you're starting to see this team take shape and, and yeah, they may not make the playoff this year, but they, they may be a feisty team that's going to play hard every night and, and, you know, give some of these good teams a run for their money. I don't know if they'll make the playoffs. I don't think they will in, in that tough uh, Western conference, but I, I like what I'm seeing from them. They play hard. Yeah, they, they've, I mean, look, they've been good. That's, that's great. It's good for, I guess, hockey in Arizona. It's good for, College kids wants to hang out at Mullet Arena. I am of the same opinion. I don't know if they're a playoff team, but I would love to see playoff hockey at the Mullet Arena. That would be that would be an interesting uh, way of doing things for sure. Uh, specific shout out to Connor Ingram who Thank has you. really taken over the job here from uh, Karel Vamelka. Uh, I was able in a fantasy league to flop him for a draft pick which i didn't think would ever exist in a world in that league i am already building next year because it is not working so uh, yeah they have they have good players we know this is a team that is they're young they're still learning they're still getting on you know they're getting all that under them they're building something there so it's it's good to see a team improve the way that they are supposed to now, I'll give a quick disappointment, although they, they've been turning it around ever since the Minnesota Wild, who we all know, you know, they fired Dean Everson. They got off to a really bad start. They've won three in a row since the firing. Uh, they, do, you know, they do have Calgary uh, in Calgary tomorrow uh, on Tuesday, the 5th. Uh, so we'll see. But I mean, I, you know, we really thought that they were going to be like that. We kind of had them locked in as that third best team in the central and there's still time for that. And Winnipeg, obviously, you know, once they signed Shifley and Hellebuck, they kind of like went on a tear and kind of kicked, they took that third spot but uh yeah we'll see what happens with minnesota but out of the gate just very disappointing you know i, I you know you guys you know talked about uh philip gustafson a lot and i kind of bought into him a little bit and now i'm kind of regretting that a little bit but there's still time for that to uh rectify itself so th that would be my disappointment uh and let's go over to you uh, i have an idea of who your disappointment is and we'll probably spend a little bit of time on them later uh but uh who is your pleasant surprise at the quarter season mark I initially was going to go to Arizona, but I, I saw that you put them as your honorable mention. Another consideration was Boston because I didn't, as much as I know that uh, Chris thought that they were going to fall off the place of the planet, I didn't think they were going to be this good at all. Um, I thought they would have been, you know, playing decently, but I didn't think they were going to be this good. But I, I'm going with the, the Vancouver Canucks as my uh, pleasant surprise. We're talking about this is the best team right now. <laughs> In Canada, <laughs> who would have thought that going into the season? And, you know, they're getting a great play from uh, Quinn Hughes and, and a lot of these guys in the lineup. And, you know, to be right behind the Golden Knights, uh, only three points, uh, that's pretty well. And, and an, uh, uh, right above the Kings as as well. And, and they're 
they're playing as well as you could play right now. And right, the last 10, they're five and five, but uh, I like what I've seen from Vancouver so far. Yeah, good team. I mean, you like you like yourself to come down to earth a little bit here, which is fine. I don't think anybody expected them to continue to continue to steamroll every team that they run into, but um, it's definitely the play of you know Quinn Hughes. Yes, Phil Horonic has come over. He looks good. Uh, they went out to go get uh, Zadorov, so he can play on the other side of Tyler Myers and basically have two of the tallest human beings on on one pairing on the blue line. Kind of seems unfair to anybody who's not like six five. So. Yes, they are in a good position. I think the play of Thatcher Demko has obviously made them the team that they are as well. It also doesn't hurt that their best players that they pay to be the best players are the best players. So you're getting the production that you thought you would get from Brock Besser. At one point, this was a guy who who couldn't be in the lineup at times. Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Boudreau was considering healthy scratching him. And then, oh, by the way, you got to come in because this guy's sick instead. Uh, you know, JT Miller is somebody I was very high on. He has paid, you know, more than I thought he yep. would do. Uh, Elias Pettersson looks really good as well. Quinn Hughes, like I said, he's firing the puck. This is a really good hockey team, which is why I think it's going to be hard for the Edmonton Oilers to catch up in that division just because they they would have to be better than either the LA Kings, the Vegas Golden Knights, or the uh, Vancouver Canucks, and I just don't see that happening. Vancouver certainly has, you know, we talked to like we when we did the season preview, it was Vegas, Edmonton, and the Kings. Like they're the top three, and then everybody else is going to fight for fourth and fifth. No, no, it is Vancouver now, and I think we're deep enough into the season where I think they've until unless they really go on a real stinker of a tear here, um, they, they've that that's their spot to lose they, they, being in the top three. And like you said, Edmonton dug themselves quite the hole. That doesn't mean they're out of the wild card yet, but. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of time. It's, you know, still December. We still got to flip the calendars. Best hockey's yet to come this season. But yeah, Vancouver, absolutely a fantastic, pleasant surprise. Now, your disappointment, I'm going to say, is probably your Devils. Yeah, you know, I talked them up all summer long. So I'm going to give a little dose of it right back. Yeah, they have been disappointing to me. Um, we're talking about a team that, a lot of people, including myself, projected to be somewhere close to that Stanley Cup run, and they are now second to last right on top of the Columbus Blue Jackets by only three points. <laughs> so uh, they have a minus four differential. Uh, the goaltending has not been great. You look at the go the whole situation, the save percentage for Vanacek, 879, Schmid, 891, and then you know, for so long, uh, Schmid uh, for the last couple of weeks have been has been playing really well, and I was like, you know what, he probably should be the starter now. And then he had a huge stinker the other night, and I'm like, well, that, there goes that. So the the goaltending is a very uh, big situation that needs to be fixed. I don't know how they're going to do it because we don't know who is available yet. I mean, there was word of uh, John Gibson, but I don't know how much he can change things. And they're also dealing with a lot of injuries and some, you know, I guess disappointing play from guys like Timo Meyer, who should be at the top of, you know, the points. And, you know, all you're getting is obviously Jack Hughes. You're getting uh, Jesper Bratt, uh, Toffoli, we all thought was going to play well. Uh, Dougie Hamilton before he went on long time, uh, long term IR and, and Luke Hughes has been very surprising. So uh, in a good way. Um, so, uh, it's, I, I don't know. I, I just, it's a lot of confusion. I don't know what's going on. They just don't seem to be gelling the way they were last year. Uh, it's the same coaching staff, a lot of the same players. They've just been through some injuries and we knew that the goaltending would be, uh, rough. We'll do a deeper dive on the devils a little bit later in a segment we're going to call devil dogs, but Anthony, uh, giving a very nice capsule of, uh, what's wrong in Jersey. We'll do a deeper dive there. Very soon. Chris, who's your pleasant surprise at the quarter point? My pleasant surprise. I'm going to give it to one player in specific. I'm going to give it to Nikita Kucherov. Ooh. I think everybody's forgotten that Nikita Kucherov is elite. And sometimes he gets lost in Tampa. And sometimes he gets lost with all the other hype of all the other big boys around the NHL. Uh, Nikita Kucherov has 40 points up to this point of the year. So if we project this out to 82 games, he's on pace for 131 points, which, by the way, for him, would be a career year. Hallelujah. So with, with all the stuff that, and, and I know sometimes when it comes time to 
draft your fantasy hockey teams. You look at Nikita Kucherov, you're just like, ah, oh, he's he's not a goal scorer. And then, you know, he's got 15 goals in 24 games. And you're like, ah, oh, he's just a guy who gets assists or he doesn't shoot the puck much. But yet here he is at the top of the leaderboard in most offensive categories, including, you know, shot production. He shoots the puck. Steven Stamkos has forgotten what that must be like. And Braden Point is not shooting enough. But here comes Nikita Kucherov and firing the puck. And he is a big reason why I think the Tampa Bay Lightning are in the position that they are. They still had to get to this point without Andre Vasilevsky. Now, granted, he's come back. It's been a slow, you know, it's been slower for him, which is fine. You know, back injuries are tough. But Nikita Kucherov is just one of those players that he he he's doing what he's supposed to do, and he's doing it at an exceptionally high level. I think he can win MVP. I just, I just at how good he is. And if this Tampa Bay team makes the playoffs, they, I, I would say he is a main, if not the main reason why Tampa Bay is where they are. If you took him out of the lineup, I don't think this Tampa Bay team would survive even one bit. I think if they lost Steven Samuels, it would be tough. I think they would get over it. I think if they lost Braden Point, it would be tough. But they would get over it. If they lost Nikita Kucherov, this team is nowhere near where they should be. We talked about when Vasilevsky went down, how important it was to, for Tampa to stay afloat, right? And and you look right now, they got 25 points. They are three away from the Maple Leafs, uh, four away from the Red Wings in third, and only five away from the Panthers. If you told me this was going to happen and, and like how we talked about it, I, I would have taken that in a heartbeat if I was a Tampa fan. Yeah, especially the time he returned because like we were talking about, oh, he'll be back before Christmas perhaps and he's back before Thanksgiving. So... Yep. Uh, you know, and, and you know, the, like you know, like you said, Kucherov absolutely was the guy that you know carried them through that stretch. You know, when it was up and down. You know, they they are coming off a backhanding of the Dallas Stars uh, from the Dallas Stars, I should say. We'll see what happens tonight. Uh, I kind of like Tampa to bounce back there uh, if you're catching this in time. Uh, nonetheless, uh, yeah, it, Kucherov absolutely could be in the MVP conversation, and this is probably with you know Stamkos's contract situation kind of being murky on where his future is going to be. This could be Tampa's last hurrah this year. This could be the last, you know, not the, and even without Stamkos, they still have a good team and they could still compete, but this is probably their last year of really having a chance at making a deep run. And it's because of the way Kucherov plays. Yeah, he has been, he has been the catalyst for this team. He's, he's, he's there. You know what you're going to get out of Nikita Kucherov. And for me, a lot of times it's looking at that shot volume. He's finished games where he's got six, seven, eight shots on goal. He's just firing the puck on net. It's going in. He's like he's he's elite, and I know this because I go back into some of the fantasy drafts that we, you know, that I've done or that I've or 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 that, or that we've mocked, and it's always Nikita Kucherov just sliding a little bit. There's always somebody else that you want to take ahead of him because he shoots the puck more, because he scores more goals, because the I I, I just feel like sometimes we disrespect him a little bit, and then you wake up and he's leading David Pasternak by like four points. He has ten more points than Braden Point on his own team. So he is by far the best player, I would say, on his team offensively. And he is, to me, at least at this point, somebody who should be considered, you know, to win the heart. Yeah, he's a victim of one of those where he just he performs at such a top level all the time that you just take it for granted and that you forget about it. You know, it's just it's it happens year in and year out. So you just kind of like I said, you just gloss over it a little. Now, who, who's your disappointment? It's going to be the whole Ottawa Senators uh, team. They are just, I, I can't believe people pay money to watch them. I don't know why I would build a rink for anybody to go and watch them. They are a sad excuse of a hockey team every time I watch them play uh, because according to TSN, they are in my geographical viewing uh, region, so I get to watch them. And I do because I'm a degenerate and I enjoy hockey at that level. But this team is just so bad at everything there's just there's nothing working for them and at some point like we get that you know pierre dorian is no longer there dj smith is going to get fired it's not a question of if it's a question of Why? when like like this team is not good and how much of it is on him i don't know but the players have been given everything that they've wanted up to up at this point you got guys who have gone out and they've collected their they're long-term contracts here, right? They, they've they gotten paid. Timmy Stutzel has gotten paid. Brady Kachuk has gotten paid. You know, Josh Norris has dealt with injuries. Anyways, he's gotten paid as well. Claude Giroux is there. He got his money when he showed up as, as well. Drake Batherson got his money. 
Jake Sanderson has his money. Thomas Shabbat has his money. Jacob Chikrin was brought, was brought in last year. And Jonas Corposalo went out to go get his bag. There's a lot of players here who were financially compensated for their efforts. And you are last in the Atlantic division. Like you can't, that that's, it's unacceptable for this team to have the commitment of money that they have to these players and have this type of results. Because we were looking at this team as saying, okay, they're they're here to take the next step. They have not only have they not taken the next step, this team looks like a seller come trade deadline. And what are you selling? You got nothing really. Maybe, maybe you move Vladimir Tarasenko to a contender and you know, fine, go away. But maybe I understand why Alex the Brinkett said I, I don't want to be here. And it's not just because you know, the city after 8 p.m., there's nothing to really do with it. But this team is just not good. When I watch them play, it is, man, like they spent a lot of time. I, I watched their game that they played against Florida. They spent more time trying to punch their opponent. And I said, great. Like, it's good to have that, you know, sticking up for your 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 teammates and showing some type of, you know, the, the key words, the grit, the attitude, the compete. But when it comes to shooting the puck and putting it in the net, they do none of that. This is an embarrassment of a team, and I don't know where they go from here. It's funny because I almost made the main segment today, why do the Sens suck instead of the Devils? So a little bit on the same wavelength there. But yeah, absolutely just a ter- you know, just a complete underachiever. It's a team that last year people thought, oh, maybe they take that jump this year. Oh, okay, well, now they got close. There was every reason for them to take the jump, and Detroit's kind of done what we thought Ottawa would do in that regard. And you're right. The Brent Cat, you know, we thought he crybabied his way out. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but again, maybe he, he was inside. He knows where the direction of the team was going, and he he made the right move, and now he's in a team that's actually going to make the playoffs maybe. Um, and we'll talk about them in a second because Patrick Kane's coming back this week. But yeah, Ottawa just, it, 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 maybe they're flying a little bit under the radar because Edmonton was so bad to start the year, so they kind of caught that break. But I think they'll start getting exposed for what they are soon, and I, there's no reason to think anything's going to turn around there. You know, we were optimistic that Eunice Corpusalo could maybe steady the crease a little bit until Forsberg was ready. That's not the case. There just is not. A, there's nothing to be really positive about there right now in uh, Ottawa. It just seems like Corpusalo was protected when he was in Los Angeles, and and you look at how well they're doing and, and how well they're playing. Uh, this is yeah, this is tough. I mean, we had high hopes. I don't think we had. I don't know if we we picked them for the playoffs but we did pick them to you know start turning it around and and start being somewhat of a contender towards the end and to see how this team has fallen you got three teams ahead of them in the lightning canadians and sabers who have a goal minus differential of 10 19 and 14 and the senators is a plus one it's definitely weird to to see this uh you know turn for for the senators and i i don't really know if it's going to get better anytime soon or if they're going to be able to turn this around but they better figure out something because uh th- this is this is uh unacceptable i think 18 points third worst in the league currently behind the sharks and blackhawks so there you go oh by the way they may not have a first pick because pierre dorian cannot file paperwork correctly so just this whole franchise this year has just been like it's something you write a novel about as a fiction and you're like oh this is a cool story you read to kids like santa claus and the tooth fairy but no this is real senator fans wake up and this is this is their team. They they get into their car. They drive forty minutes to Canada in the middle of nowhere to watch them do whatever they do. It is it is miserable. I think uh, Sharks fans and Senators fans should uh, try have a competition at who has it worse this year. I mean, in each conference, you're pretty bad. You get you take the cake in each conference for sure. But who has it worse right now? I have no idea. At least the Sharks are winning some hockey games lately. But uh, let's uh, you know, sp- staying in the Atlantic Division. Uh, Patrick Kane, he's going to be returning this week at some point. There is a chance that he could be back tomorrow going into Buffalo, which would be pretty appropriate. Otherwise, he could return at home on Thursday or Saturday this week. Uh, so we're going to do a little fantasy focus on him. He's obviously going to be in the top power play unit, but you know you, you could speculate about who you're going to put him on a line with. Uh, once Dylan Larkin comes back from you know what he's dealing with and our thoughts and you know out to the the whole Larkin family with uh, with what they're dealing with. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could, you know, is he going to be on a line with Larkin and the print cat? Is he going to be on a line with Lucas Raymond? 
uh, you know, or in JT Comfer, you know, he's going to be somewhere in that top six. Um, is he a, an immediate pickup or is he a wait and see guy? Because I feel like almost there's one person in every league that's going to be like, oh, I got to go get Kane if he's coming back. Is he somebody you need to spend fab budget on? Somebody you hope that you have a top waiver guy on? Or is he somebody that you're like, well, let's see what he does first? I think it's wait and see what he does first. I mean, we saw at the end of last season with the Rangers, he was getting really slow. Then he had to have the surgery in the off season. Um, I'm surprised that they're going to throw him up on the top six line this early uh, with him coming back. I thought that maybe they would, you know, monitor his minutes and, and see what, uh, see if he could build up towards uh, the top six line. But, you know, if they're going to put him in the top six, I, I don't know. I I hope he just doesn't mess with the groove that Detroit has already put together by adding him to this lineup. Like they they they've been playing so well, and they're you know top three uh, in in the Atlantic Division. I I hope he just doesn't mess with the uh, trying to chemistry. The word. chemistry. Perfect. That's the perfect word. Chemistry that that the Red Wings have already put together. I mean, here's the thing. He he's already like seventy five percent owned in Yahoo League. So if if you're looking for him, he's probably in a really shallow league where you can just kind of wait it out because he's probably not better. Uh, he wanted to be in Detroit. In all his interviews, he said that's where he wanted to be, and that's where he's ended up. And I think he is comfortable as well if he's not the main focus of a team anymore, especially at his stage in his career. He doesn't need to be. He can be a supporting player there to help others. You know, the, the brain cats he's played with Alex before, help guys like Lucas Raymond, and kind of just elevate the game. I will say this. He's coming back from a major surgery. I had to put on my medical jacket to find out what hip resurfacing uh, surgery was and granted I now know a little bit more about it it's a major procedure for a player to go through fun fact as well I think there's like three NHL players who have had it before Ed Jovanovsky being one Ryan Kessler being the second and Nick Backstrom being the third so Ed Jovanovsky came back a little bit wasn't very great Ryan Kessler has never played hockey again and Nick Backstrom well we know what that has given so I wouldn't jump the gun right now for Patrick Kane. He did say that he's feeling a lot better, that he's playing without pain, that he feels like he can move left and right, which is important when you play hockey to be able to, you know, shift around players. And you know how Patrick Kane's footwork is there. The speed may not be there, but the agility is always what made him so good. So if he's going to be playing without pain, if it's going to help him feel better, sure, all for it. But man, this is a tough surgery for a player to come back to. And right now, like, statistically players do not have a ton of success when they come back from this. So I don't know if Patrick Kane is going to come in and make an immediate impact to this Detroit team. I see him more as falling into kind of like that third line winger kind of spot, second power play unit, a more of a support player for what this team needs. Maybe he plays the 13 minutes a night. Maybe he bumps up to 15. If he gets more power play time, if they want to put him on that first unit, kind of facilitate the puck around. They can go ahead and do so, but I'm not looking at him to come out here and just take the league by storm or all of a sudden have this magical comeback where he starts to be a point per game player. I, I, I don't think it's there. I, I think this is a tough spot for him. I don't know how his body's going to hold up either. There's too many red flags here for me to just say, okay, I'll go out and spend a ton of fab on him. Like if somebody else wants to do it, go right ahead. And if you have a roster spot that you want to take a risk on, sure, go ahead. He, he can he can't make it worse. He can only make it better. So there's you know there's very little risk and a ton of upside here. But I want to see him play a little bit and kind of gauge from there how his body is going to feel. Because again, players have tried to come back from this and it has not worked out very well at all. I think regardless of what any time a player misses that much time, regardless of it being a hip injury or whatever it might be. Especially at Kane's age, you got to ease him back in. I don't think they're going to trot him out there 20 to 23 minutes a night. Go, go, go. Um, there's going to be a gradual release, you know, period. I don't think they'd be trying to play him this week if the doctors and everybody were saying, you know, had any trepidation about him going. I think they realize that if Detroit's really going to have a chance at making the playoffs and being a team that can stay towards the top of the Atlantic, they need Kane throughout. I have heard that they do have a, unofficial handshake agreement that if Detroit is not legitimately in a playoff hunt uh, down the stretch that Kane would be dealt. So, I mean, I can't imagine Kane would want to rush himself back and jeopardize a chance, even if things don't go well in Detroit, even if they just kind of hover around 500. 
I think he's also looking at, okay, if it's not going to be here, it could be somewhere else after the trade deadline. So I don't think as, as much as guy is athletes of like a cane level where you can't tell them to sit, they're going to play. They want to be out there as soon as they can. I think at this point in his career, he also knows like, Hey, if I, if I got to be smart about this and not just go right out when I can. So I think he also knows if he's saying he's ready to go and he feels like he's ready to go. I think he's somewhere between being gradually brought back in and then, you know, towards the end of the year, you know, the, well, he starts out at the beginning and then being a top work dog. I could see him getting like 16, 17 minutes a night, you know, some of that being on the power play. And yeah, I, I, I'm on a wait and see approach too, because, you know, he had his flashes with the Rangers where he looked great last year. And then he had his flashes where, you know, he had his periods where he didn't do much. So, you know, I, I don't think we're going to get a real read on what Patrick Kane can do for at least a couple of weeks here. That is, look, that's, uh, I'm 100% there. I just don't know how his body's going to hold up at this point to everything that's going to be thrown at him. If he does play the power play even more, great. If he, and if he's productive, even better. Like, he's, he's he's here to do well, and I truly believe that if he is, you know, he's done all this rehab, he's done this surgery, he clearly believes that he can play, and he clearly believes that he can play at a high enough level to warrant, you know, convincing a team to show up and there were teams that, that were in on him there were multiple teams who were taking a run at him and seeing if it works so the interest was there Th that means teams believe that he's okay they probably saw his medical and you know got green light from doctors and saying hey he can he can do this i'm just coming from this with a lot more skepticism because i just i mean man these are some big names of players who have gone through this and it has not worked out very well like you said when he was with the rangers at times he is not He's not out there to play defense. He's giving Thursday night, 10 p.m. defense kind of vibes out here. So, I mean, it is it is what it is at this point with Patrick Kane. You're going to accept the good that comes with him. You're going to ex ex you know, accept the bad that comes with him, but you're just hoping there's a lot more good in the tank than there is bad. I think at the end of the day, I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable to think he could potentially put up 20 goals the rest of the way. If, the, if they're going to put it, if they're going to optimize his minutes to be in offensive situations, power play, I mean, 15 to 20, I think, is like, okay, that was a really good year for Patrick Kane. I think in that range is where you're looking ideally, but probably more realistically in the 10 to 15 range. We'll see, though. Um, so, we'll, you know, there's Patrick. You know, we'll, when he makes his return, we'll see how, who he's playing with. And that's going to be, you know, mixed up, too, a little bit. They're going to try different things, see what happens. Obviously, he is familiar with the print cat from the Chicago days, so they will give that a shot at some point for sure. And yeah, we'll see what ha the effect on the wings in a very you know tough Atlantic division with Boston those uh, still playing very well. Florida having a very good season. Toronto, you know, we'll see if they can get you know, get, you know they're playing a little bit better. We'll see if they can bounce back. But then there's Detroit as that four spot. So uh, there we go with Patrick Kane. Now for the waiver wire this week, Chris, who are you targeting this week to uh, go out and try and uh, help your team? That's it. I am looking at my man Marco Rossi. I mean this this kid. High draft pick, something we expected a lot from. He's had to battle a ton of injuries to start his career, and now he's getting a look. He is he, he played between uh, Kirill Kaprizov, he played between Matt Zuccarello, and I think maybe the coaching change will do him some good. I think maybe just let the Minnesota Wild go out there, play some hockey, score you know, three goals in two games. He has offense to his game, and we know that. We know that he can come in here. The thing for me, or at least for Minnesota, has been they have no depth down the middle. This is a team that just refuses to go out and get a centerman to play down the middle. They've always been strong defensively with good goaltending, so you figure, fine, we don't have to do that. We don't have to worry about it. We'll just trot out whatever we have and have success. And this year, that has not happened one bit. But Marco Rossi is available in, I mean, every single league that you are going to look at here. And if he's going to get the opportunity to play those top line minutes with, you know, arguably the two best players on the team, then he's going to be able to produce. I think Joel Erickson egg play on the second line is fine. Let him play with Matt Boldy. Matt Boldy being back as well kind of helps the offense a little bit, takes a little bit of pressure off that top line, always have to score goals. But I want to see them just, just let him run here a little bit. Let him go. Let him go out there. Let him play. Let's see what he's got. And let's see if he can support those, you know, those his two wingers with him. Have some success. Maybe at some point get to that top power play unit and just, you know, tread him out there the 18, 19, 20 minutes a night that those top centermen play. Is he a top centerman in the league? I don't know yet. I'd like to see it. But he is in a position to succeed. And I am of the belief that 
in fantasy hockey, you need, you know, sometimes you need quantity, but you also want the quality. And in this case, you can get both. You can get a player that is playing with some quality players, get a ton of ice time, go out there. I, I still don't know if Minnesota is like a four real team here. They've been good three games and they could go on a seven game losing streak if they wanted to here. So if there's probably a middle ground to here, Minnesota is going to be trailing at times, which means you need the best players out on the ice, which means you need part of it. There's a lot of upside here. Again, very little risk. If you're in a league where you're searching for some goals, some points, you're looking for some offense, it's probably there. It's not going to hurt you. There's a ton of center options as well in most leagues, right? So you can choose whichever one you want. But I think upside here for wherever your team is sitting now, if it works out great and he's, let's say, a point-per-game player down the you know rest of the year way, great. He made out well, even if he's at a .9 point pace, even, you know, still good. But there's very little risk here, ton of upside. I'm in. The other thing, you know, you said they're very weak down the middle. It's funny because Joel Eric's neck is a very, very well-rounded center. It's almost like, well, we got him. We don't need anything else. And it's like, no, no, you need like four of these. So good good on there with Rossi being the waiver, uh, you know, target for the week. And also just, you know, Matt Zuccarello, and he's always been a kind of an assist machine. 20 assists in 22 games. So almost an assist. Uh, if that's some, somewhere where you need some help, that's a guy you can look at. But uh uh, yeah, there is your fantasy focus for uh, the upcoming week here in the NHL season. Now, we like to spend at least one good segment on one team in particular. And today we're going to talk about the Devil Dogs right now. Uh, New Jersey, uh, just things not going well. They, you know, they were the darlings of the offseason, you know, including all three of us on this show. And, you know, Anthony kind of encapsulated all their issues earlier. So I won't go through too much of that right now. Only six pl- points out of second place in the Metro. Very streaky team this year, coming off a 6-3 ugly loss to the uh, suddenly cagey San Jose Sharks. Dougie Hamilton out uh, indefinitely with a torn pectoral muscle. Never want to lose your top defenseman there. Although with Luke Hughes, they are pretty... You don't want to lose Dougie Hamilton, but the thing he does bring to the table, at least you're well equipped to replace that with Luke Hughes to a degree. Um, They were without Heeshear and Hughes for stretches. Hughes still leads the team with 30 points. Uh, Tyler Toffoli has been has lived up to expectations, but, uh, and yes, but Brad's been playing well, but other than that, it's just been, it's been tough there. And, you know, it hasn't been Timo time yet either. You know, he, he's got to get going, but you know, is, is this a coaching thing? Is this, they got a little too fat on their own expectations thing? Like what, what, what is the, like, how, how does New Jersey figure this out? Yeah. I, I, I just, like I said earlier, I am as much as confused as anybody with what's going on here. A lot of these players have returned from last year. The coaching staff has returned from last year. We all know that the goaltending was going to be an issue. We didn't think it was going to be this bad during the regular season, but it has been. Uh, Vitek Vanacek has not been the same since game one uh, against the Rangers uh, in the first round. And, you know, as as good as Schmidt filled in, he's going to have those moments like he did against the Sharks where he's going to get, you know, pummeled. And, and that's what happened. You got Timo Meyer, who should be on one of the top two lines, now relegated to the third line. That's frustrating. Losing Dougie Hamilton, who, you know, a, a veteran presence on the defense, losing him has it does not help at all, especially for, uh, you know, being on long term IR. They did bring up Simon Nemich and he got a couple assists a couple of points, which was nice to see in his debut. But, you know, you really don't want this all being just kids, right? Like you need some semblance of veteran presence in there. And, um, you know, without having Damon Severson anymore and John Marino, um, I don't know if that has affected them. A lot of people say it hasn't, but I, I think for some, uh, a little bit, it, it has. Uh, did I say John Marino? Uh, Ryan Graves, maybe. I, I meant Ryan Graves. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I said John Marino, but I meant Ryan Graves. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, like I said, I, I've got no answers right now for what we're watching, except for that this goaltending has not been great. And the fact that maybe all this talk about this team being, you know, a top contender, maybe the talk has gotten to them. And, and you know, you're seeing the frustrations play out. Even in the beginning of the season, there was like talk that they're, you know, they weren't playing as hard or I got nothing. I got absolutely nothing. Uh, the goaltending to me is the big one, but yeah. No, that, I mean, that they, you, if you wait, look, losing, losing to San Jose is one thing. 
giving up six goals to a team that can barely score a goal and a half per game when they had they were like oh nine and oh on there they had to want a game on the road and then they walk into new jersey and just just one after another just keep scoring goals like not only should the devils get zero points they should have lost the point you cannot lose to the sharks like that you can't like this team looks extremely fragile at this point like when they start giving up goal like they know they're not going to get goaltending you play very different hockey knowing that you can't take a risk offensively because the guy in the blue paint's not going to stop a beach ball and that is a that is a problem that needs to be fixed we talked about it right at the beginning of the season maybe connor hellebuck would be a great solution then he decided he wants to live in winnipeg and continue on that journey and that's worked out pretty well for him good for him so the devils have to figure something out they have been bitten by the injury bug and Again, every team deals with this. So, and I guess the good part for them is that they still have players who can step into these roles and take over. Like Luke Hughes can come in and just do what he needs to do. Simon Nemec can come up and you know produce. Like they have, they have a core of just great players who can step up and do things. Which is why it's so frustrating watching them be bad and. To me, it, it, it's just goaltending. Either you commit to playing better defensively and you figure that out. Or you say, hey, we just can't take the chances that we're taking. We need to make sure that the puck stays out of our net. Because even if you score four, you're giving up six to San Jose and it's not working. So either you commit to play defense or you go out and you try to find a solution to the goaltending and whatever that may be. I don't think they have money to be able to go out and, I don't know, facilitate trades for like guys like Jacob Markstrom or stuff like that. Maybe they go down a different path where they got to go with Something that's a little bit cheaper. We talked about Connor Ingram. I don't, I mean, Arizona is willing to flip anything for a, a draft pick. Anything. You could, you, you could probably flip them the, you know, I don't know, the beach house up in, you know, wherever, somewhere nice in New York. And they'll be like, yeah, we'll take it. Sure. Go ahead. Whatever we, you know, throw so it a draft pick and we'll take it. So the devils have to find a way to stop the bleeding and goal. And if that means that they need a three headed monster there for somebody to figure it out and run with it, sure. Do it, do whatever you got to do to figure out how you're going to keep the puck out of your net, but they cannot keep coming into these games, giving up goals. They're, they're too good to be this bad. And in the division that they play in and the conference that they play in, if they fall too far back, they may not be able to claw out of it. Like even being just like five, six points out of it, like, the East is just such a dog fight to get out of. If you give up games in your division, it's so hard to come back. Good. Oh, uh, yeah. The you know watching that game against San Jose and and just you know obviously we know that the the goalies are not going to be up to par, but then you watching the defense as well, and you know they're not playing in position. They're uh, it's just the lines haven't been consistent either. The, the, Lindy is doing whatever he can to switch up the lines and trying to make something work and nothing is working. So I, I don't know if it's maybe it's the defensive coach that has to go or, or, or what they have to do, but they need to figure this out soon because you got a Rangers team that is kind of, you know, at the moment, you know, running away with the, uh, the Atlantic division and, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Metro. I am off today. <laughs> but yeah. he, is, he is stunned by watching the puck go behind of the goal. He's like, I don't know what's yeah. happening. <laughs> they, 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 they have messed with my mind. But uh, yeah, the, the Rangers are pretty much running away right now with the Metro division. Uh, the Hurricanes are are you know not too far behind. They're finding their way after yeah. about to start. They're starting to find their way. You got a Capitals team who are probably on their last leg, and Ovechkin's not going to to back down from anything. And, and you know the Islanders are they play their gritty type of Islanders game. So the the Devils really need to figure out a way to pick this up, and it has to be soon. Like it has to be in this month that they have to turn a corner here, because if they don't, they're they are going to be a team that was you know in the playoffs last year and out of the playoffs this year. Like you said, yeah, the, the division does them no favors because, like, you know, Philly's playing up the expectation. You know, in Pittsburgh right now, about playing, hovering around 500 hockey, you know, they got a run coming from them at some point. At some point, they're going to, you know, rattle off six or seven. They're going to boost themselves in the standings. It's not over yet, clearly, for New Jersey by any means. They got the talent to run off a streak. But, like, yeah, like you said, the goaltending issues have to be figured out. They do miss a guy like Ryan Graves probably more than they thought they were going to. And yet just consistency would be nice, you know, but you didn't have it because of injuries at the beginning of the year. 
now that you're, you know, and just when you're starting to finally get healthy, now you just lose Dougie Hamilton. You're well equipped to, you're, you're equipped to at least weather the storm there on the blue line. I will say when Timo gets going, he it's getting past the point of him making up for lost time. But when he does go, he is going to just dominate for like a week or two, like straight. Like he is one of those guys when he gets going, he really gets going. But Devils could use that right now. And, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, I, I, like Chris said, maybe, maybe you got to find a goalie that you, if you can't get a top notch goalie, find somebody that could be a three headed monster and they push each other. And then you f- take the top two to the playoffs with you. But, you know, it, it, it's, if you can't, you know, if you can't address it on the blue one, you got to somehow address it in the crease. And that's just not an easy deal to pull off. It's one thing that, oh, we're weak on the right side. We got to go find a right winger. Oh, we need a left handed shot defenseman. Blah, blah, blah. It is, you know, the goalie market is, you know, you're already dealing with a, a much less pool, uh, a thinner pool to begin with. So we'll see what happens here in the coming days with the Devils. But hey, at least you got the Hughes Brothers game coming up tomorrow night to look forward to. That'll be fun. You know, it's, you know, it happens. I think, you know, we had the Stahl brothers have done it. Three brothers in a game. I'm sure the Sutter brothers happened at some point or another. Um, but that, that'll at least be a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling for you. You know, have that game, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah that, that's, what, that's what you got right now. That, that, that's what you grasp. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, so much, so much, fun. just so much thrill is just <laughs> sitting there wondering what's happening. How did, like, how did we get here? You know, is this real? Are we living in a matrix world where I don't understand? Just absolutely stunned, which is how I feel. I, of the two of my shares of the New Jersey Devils that I own, uh, I was lucky enough to own Nico Heischer and Timo Meyer. I, that's how. That's all I've been. No, and sorry, and Dougie Hamilton. So everything I've touched so far in New Jersey has has been hurt or has failed miserably at some point. So my apologies for that. Well, and the return of Nico Heischer, um a couple of weeks ago, uh, they they went on a little bit of a run for a couple of games, and then they hit San Jose, and you know, right back to where we were before. Those, those pesky, those pesky sharks, and their you know, high scoring offense and. Elite goaltending. I mean, they're they're a wagon right now. The Sharks. I mean, they are just cruising. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, listen. They, they, law of averages. They got off to such a bad start. They had to get a few wins in a row at some point, right? Or at least be competitive a few games in a row, right? But you know, that's a, you know, there's hope for the Devils to. Be, you, you, something's not right in New Jersey, but it, it it'll probably get figured out. So at least you have that. You have a, everything's in place for it. To once you do get it figured out, they should get cooking. We'll see it. But like you said, it's got to happen this month. You can't afford to wait until this can't be a January. We can't be talking about this in January. Can't be. Now, uh, like you said, across the river, the team running away from it is the New York Rangers, and they're running away with the Metro. Hopefully this is not a case of peaking too soon. They did release their third jerseys this week. It's not the Stadium Series jersey, but you see that there on the screen on your left. And then the jersey that kind of inspired it, uh, was the road jerseys from the 1970s there back in the Phil Esposito days. So, of course, as like we always like to ask here, sweater weather, which one are you buying? Uh, and let's start with you as a Devils fan who would never buy a Ranger jersey in the first place. But if you had if you had a gun to your head and had to buy one of those, which one would it be? I got to ask a question first about those two, about that, the the classic jersey, the the original. Yeah. Is the logo that small on that jersey? Uh, uh, so uh, on the actual 1970s jersey, I think it was yes. a little bit bigger than that. That was one that I just found as a such. So uh, uh, not quite as big as the one on the left, so, but uh, bigger than the w- the way it exists there. Okay, because that was going to be a determining factor on me choosing that jersey, or and I was like, man, that's that's way too small for that. Uh, I need something a little bit in between. But yeah, I would choose the classic one. I just like the how the has the red stripe uh, around and the white uh, on the on the sleeve. I I like that look. This new one is a little too plain. I, I do like the emblem, though. I do like the emblem on, on the jersey. Uh, they, they don't have a lot of emblems on the jersey. They usually go with the Rangers, you know, typed out diagonally. They had New York at one point for a little while. They had the Liberty head. They've done stuff with that. They did go to that Shield logo for their uh, Winter Classic. That's my jersey favorite one. Stars. That's one of mine too. Winter Classic jersey because I'm, right. I'm a sucker for the cream jerseys, whether in any sport, baseball, uh, you know, hockey. Uh, so uh, that you know that one right there, I think is that would be my favorite Ranger jersey. Is that that Winter Classic one? It's 
one of my top Ranger jerseys. I have Brad Richards since he scored the game-winning goal, that one, uh, or the shootout, if I recall correctly. But nonetheless, um, yeah, so for me, I don't really like the one on the left. I don't like the Rangers' new third jerseys. I think, I, I, I understand, you're trying to be different, you're trying to, I just, and maybe they'll, Maybe they'll look better on the ice. Maybe it's one of those where it's in the photos and the press release and like, and then once you get it out on the ice, it's like, oh, those look sharp under the garden lights. But I, I, just, I don't, the stri- it's too busy, the stripes on the sleeves for me. It, I, it I, is weird. I'm absolutely going Rangers Road jerseys of the 70s. That blue with the red and white and that look, absolutely. Uh, what do you got? Chris? Look, I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying both of them are not very good. Uh, those are low quality <laughs> tier jerseys to me. They're, they're just, they just don't do it. <laughs> they just they're they're not very good. Um, maybe because I I was not uh, born when the right one was even out. So maybe I just don't know my hockey nostalgia as much. Uh, if I had to pick one gun to my head, it would be the third jersey though. Um, okay. The color's not bad. I mean, I, I guess I'm a sucker a little bit more for the darker jersey. I get the lines on like the elbows are not, you know, they're not great, but. I mean, I can live with it. It's fine. I don't, like it, it's it, it. It is what it is, kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like it, it is what it is. So I'd, I'd I'd go with the Rangers third jersey just because why not? Because it's not as bad as the you know the retro one. I will say this though: if I had to pick one that I really enjoyed, it would be the one with the Lady Liberty head on it. Um, that's the one I would probably pick. Uh, the worst of all times, I don't know why the Rangers do this. I don't know why they still get away with it because it's just bottom tier college hockey stuff. But the ones where they put like Rangers across, Colorado has one as well, where it just says like Avalanche or just says Colorado. I think you, you mean you mean the the look of an original six jersey that has not it's changed. The college jersey we twenties. You mean you mean that look? You mean that that that's, that's we finish at five o'clock and at four fifty? You're submitting it to your editor and saying, "Hey, this is what I got." And they said, "You know what?" That's all we got today, so we're going to print it, and we're going to let it go. Like Colorado had one of the worst ones. The Rangers, the same thing. When I look at that, I'm like, okay, like we went through that phase. We can just never see that jersey again. Not every jersey is a success. And like it's just – it's so – like it screams – like when you look at college hockey jerseys, they all look the same like that, right? Wisconsin says Wisconsin because it, it is what it is. But they have no budget. They have no budget sometimes to buy jerseys. This is the Rangers. A billion dollar franchise. Come up with something better. Stop wearing them. I'll agree. The Liberty Col- one is the one I would choose, though. That's the Colorado diagonal look. I'll agree was kind of like lazy and low. No, you're never going to get me to convince otherwise on the Rangers. To me, it's a classic look. I love that blue jersey. And you know, shout out to uh, Coupe Fiasco, who's in here about to record the next show. Uh, he throws in the chat the old uh, mid '90s yellow meth bear look, and I agree. I never ever <laughs> liked that. I, I did that look was like no, like you're the Bruins. Like why would you do that? Like it's it, I I dislike it less now than I did back then. But yeah, that. Uh, that, that that was a bad one too, but uh, those yeah, we, are the, those are terrible. But again, I they're both bad, not because they're Ranger jerseys. I will be objective to it, but um, I mean, that's just not it. Well, not all of us can be Canadians fans with that classic look. And I will say, just to bring it back to your Devils, Ant, the the big biggest mist of all time is a black Devils jersey. Just take the red jersey and just flip the black and red scheme, and yep. it, it would sell like wildfire. Let's see what happens with the stadium series if they do anything. I haven't heard anything about a jersey change or they haven't announced anything for that. So they do have a black jersey that just says jersey on it, but that yeah. nothing with the emblem. I, I the They do have a fan one that's a black jersey with the gray and the red in the middle. So, but but the, they they never use that. It was just more of like a fan service jersey. Yeah, I mean, the NHL has been pretty tight-lipped about the... Um stadium the winter classic jersey so it'll be interesting to see what comes out i would assume they're going to reveal one matchup one day one matchup the next day or something like that but uh we'll see what they do with that but that'll do it for another edition of better hockey now here on the better sports network and fantasy alarm youtube page it's been a fun chock full show talk some patrick kane nhl to quarter season point and uh marco rossi being a guy you could go rely on uh for your waiver wire this week but Mr. At Rivera, Aunt Rivera 86 on Twitter for at Fuzzy Chris 91 below me there, Mr. Christopher Merez. I'm at Pucking Thoughts Adam Bernard. We'll be back with you next Monday here on BHN on BSN. Better Hockey Now is on the Better Sports Network.